All right, questions from last time. Anything on the lymphatic system? Clear as mud, right? Yeah, clear as mud. All right, three most important things from last time. Yeah, make sure you know the difference between Proteus syndrome and elephantiasis, right? The elephant man did not have elephantiasis. It's totally different. One's a genetic disorder, one's a human parasite. So, back to Teresa's point, right? The two largest lymphatic vessels are ducts, the thoracic duct being the largest, and then the right uh, lymphatic duct being smaller of the two, and where the drainage is. Know what drains what areas of the body. One more thing. Fat system. Yep, yeah, Tim. Say that again. Yes. Make sure you know the four major lymphatic organs, and they are what? Spleen, tonsils. Say that again. Lymph nodes. Thymus plant. Right. Okay, so we're going to start, um, and we're actually right on schedule, so things are perfect right now. Um, we're going to do the respiratory system. This will be the last system on this third exam. However, however far we get in the next two lectures is where you will be for that exam. So everything else for the rest of the semester will be on the final. Okay? All right, if somebody would lower the lights. So the organization of the respiratory system. So we're going to talk about the pharynx. We've already talked about the pharynx quite a bit, but we're going to finish the story. We're going to talk about the larynx. This is the voice box area. Okay? The trachea is the largest airway in your body. Okay? The bronchial tree, respiratory blood vessels, muscles of respiration, and then we'll do clinical cases. What we're not going to do this semester is we're not going to really talk about the mechanics of breathing. Okay? That's what you do next semester, how it actually all works. So it's important that you understand that this is one of the big five. The big five are the nervous system, the muscular system, the kidneys, the endocrine system, the cardiovascular system. Well, there's six because I usually put muscle and nerves together and then the respiratory system. So this is one of the really important ones that, that comes up next semester. Okay. Function. Pretty straightforward, right? Major function of the respiratory system is to supply the blood with oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. It's very, very important. Okay, you can't go very long without oxygen to your brain. You go five minutes, you've already started some brain damage. Okay, that's how, that's your time window. That's how much storage you have with myoglobin and hemoglobin before you start causing some major problems. Not very long, okay? And carbon dioxide becomes, again, next semester you'll, you'll go through this, is problematic because carbon dioxide will directly affect the acidity of your blood. So the more of it you accumulate, the more acidic your blood becomes. To achieve this, the respiratory system works closely with the cardiovascular system. Sometimes it's referred to as the cardiorespiratory system because they work so closely together. Organization. Most of these parts, hopefully you know, you've heard of the four of your nose. Everybody's got one, right? The pharynx we're going to talk about, that's the throat, the back of the throat, a lot of interesting things that go on there. The larynx is where the voice box is. The trachea is also known as the windpipe. It's the largest airway in the body. Okay? Bronchi and then the lungs. The bronchi are smaller airways that go into the sacs that actually is where you move oxygen and CO2 between. And then finally, of course, the lungs. 
You divide the system into upper and lower respiratory. If you've ever had an upper respiratory infection or you've ever had a lower respiratory infection, we're going to talk about what that actually means when a physician says that. So those are the two major sections. The upper respiratory system consists of the nose, the pharynx, and associated structures. So an upper respiratory infection usually presents itself as a stuffy and gritty nose. Your sinuses are usually infected, right? Your nose, your ears are involved in this because of where the pharynx is. And so you could have an ear infection, a throat infection, right? All kinds of uh, sinus infection. It all works into one. So that's an upper respiratory system. The lower respiratory system is then everything else. Right? You have the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and the lungs. So the larynx is the dividing line. It's the Mason-Dixon line between the upper and the respiratory, uh, upper and lower respiratory system. Okay, this is a diagram, you should know it. Not because I'm necessarily going to ask you anything on it, but you should have a general sense of where all these structures are. Right? Here's the, the nasal cavity. You should know what these things are. They're called turbinates or conche, right? And the reason that they're there is because they make airflow turbulent. And that becomes a good thing in the nose. We'll talk about that. Right? This is this area back here, and there are three they're subdivided into three parts. It's called the pharynx. Okay? People that have sleep apnea and sleep problems, this is the area that's problematic. The larynx, here's the voice box. We'll talk about the protuberance. Here's what the trachea looks like. It's got lots of big rings on it. It's nearly impossible to collapse the trachea. It would take a massive hit to do it. Right? But it's not impossible to collapse this, and it's not impossible to collapse this. Okay? But it's difficult to do it here. And that's because it's reinforced with these cartilage wings. Okay? And then you've got two major bronchi, and then of course the lungs, and then we'll go through the bronchial tree. So that's the basic gist, right? So this is all upper respiratory. So if you say you have an upper respiratory infection, you're not talking about the lungs. Talking about a lower respiratory infection, usually they're talking about the lung. The nose functions includes provides an airway for respiration. When you're doing what's called eupnea, you're doing something called quiet breathing. That's what you should be doing right now. And assuming you're not talking, most of you are probably breathing through your nose. And that's actually the best way to breathe when you're quietly breathing, especially if you go on an airplane or a train or you're on a ship. I'm going to tell you why in a second. But that's the way you're designed to breathe when you're not moving a lot of air. It moistens, warms, and filters the air. When you breathe through your nose, the air coming in, you add moisture to that. So before the air gets to your lungs, it is moistened. Okay, that's really, really important. The entire inside of your body has to be moist, right? Because that helps it. When things start to dry out, they don't work well in the human body. It warms it. Same thing if you're breathing on a very cold day. Now, it hasn't been cold yet, but it will get cold, right? and a lot of people do this instinctively, you start breathing through your nose. Because it becomes really, really painful when it gets really, really cold to breathe through your mouth. Actually, if you're an athlete, if it gets cold enough and you're running when it's really, really cold, you can actually do damage to your airways and to your lungs. Because it gets that cold here, right? And that's why you see people wearing masks or scarves it's to prevent the damage from occurring because that air is super dry and very, very cold and it can damage the mucous membranes. Yep, Teresa. Why is it when I breathe cold air, my nose hurts? Is that a reason? Could be lots of reasons. Could be septal damage, could be um, the, the cold air 
dries it out, <coughs> right? And some people know to get yes, that. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, uh, I remember watching a documentary on uh, mummies, and they had uh, physicians saying that they could tell that this person uh, breathed through their mouth blood just by the, the structure of the airways. How does that happen? It's like anything else. It's, it, you know, the more you use something, the more damage occurs to it. So they can tell when you breathe through your mouth, right, you're moving much more air, right? And when you breathe through your mouth, you're bypassing the nose. And when you bypass the nose, you're not going to damage it because there's a shearing force, right? <clears throat> Just like water does the same thing, blood will do the same thing, air will shear and cause damage. So. When you use something from preliminary, like the throat, the mouth, to breathe, this area will not look the same. If you pri primarily breathe through your nose, then your throat won't look the same. They can tell by the cells and by the physical structure changes. So getting back to Teresa's issue, you know, specifically when people, when it gets really, really cold, some people get nosebleeds. Why? because the air is so cold, right, that it dries out some of the very superficial blood vessels that are in your nose. And when they dry out, what happens to the vessel wall? It collapses, it cracks, right? So some people, if you're, if you're extremely sensitive, right, you're not used to the cold and you're extremely sensitive, it might actually be painful to breathe through your nose but there's an advantage. So it moistens, warms, and it filters the air. Now those turbinates, why are those turbinates important? Those turbinates, there's two types of flow, okay? There's something called laminar flow. So if you're looking at a tube, a little bit of physics here. If you're looking at a tube, right, that's what's called laminar flow. Everything's going in one direction. You don't want laminar flow through your nose, right? What you actually want is turbulent flow. And what's turbulent flow? So it's all over the place. Why do you want turbulent flow through the nose? That's what those turbinates do, CJ. So it touches the sides so it warms up. So it, so it touches the sides so it warms up, why else? What's actually in that cavity, Eliza? Yeah, because what's in that cavity? Mucus. Right, goblin cells, what else? Hair cells, yes. That's exactly why the hair's in there. The hair and the mucus work together to trap particles. And they are a line of defense for your immune system. So you, they're called turbinates, conchae because they actually cause what's called turbulent flow. It's less efficient to move air, right? But it's much better to do what? To keep you healthy, to keep your nasal passages warm. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Yeah, the vessels, some people simply have in their nasal cavity, they have a very superficial or set of superficial vessels, meaning it's not covered by much. And so when it gets cold, typically this is when it happens, they dry out fast. They don't have as much mucus, the goblet cells. Some people produce a lot more mucus. Some people have more hair, right? So the more mucus, the more hair, and the less superficial the vessels, the less likely to have that. But if you, if you don't have any of that, or you have less of it, then they're going to dry out faster. And so that's the problem. So even into adulthood. Now, for males, it becomes less of a problem because we, we have a lot of hair in our bodies. So for males, if, you, if you're a kid that had nosebleeds a lot, you're less likely to have them as an adult because, especially as you get older, there's just more hair, right? So it's, it's kind of protected. But for females, it's not and so they tend to have them happen longer. But it doesn't mean you can't have it as an adult male, it just means less. So yeah, those are some of the, so some of the minutial differences from person to person, okay? Any other questions? 
So it contains the olfactory receptors, right? These receptors go into your brain. Smell receptors. Most of your taste, the things you taste, are from actually olfactory receptors, right? And we all know this intuitively. Why? Because when you get sick and you have an upper respiratory infection, does food that you like, I'll stick with food that you like, taste the same? It doesn't because you can't smell it anymore. And so a lot of what you think is taste is actually olfactory receptors, right? And so you know this when you get sick. All right, the nose consists of the external and nose, right? And then there's the internal nose. Makes sense. The nasal cavity. The external nose, this part here in the front, is composed of hyaline cartilage, right? Your nose is actually composed of hyaline cartilage and bone. The further back you go toward your skull, this part back here is actually bone. But up front, all of this is hyaline cartilage, right? It's really smooth type of cartilage. It's the weakest of the three. It works. The nasal cavity. Root is formed by the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bones, right? The two that look like a bat, butterfly. Again, this is in the back, not the front. The floor is formed by the hard palate. divided by something called the nasal septum. If you've ever had your nose broken, there's a high chance that the septum has been deviated. Sometimes people are born with a deviation, and they have always had problems breathing through one of their nostrils, okay? It can be fixed. For both cases, if it becomes problematic, you have a rhinoplasty, you have a nose job, it'll change what your nose looks like, but then it'll fix it. So here's the nares, right? The nares are the opening. These again are the conchae or the turbinates in the nasal cavity here. This is the hyaline cartilage. This is the bone here, right? We've got the ethmoid and the sphenoid bones. This is the hard palate right here that's made out of bone. external openings of the nasal cavity. The nostrils are also called nares. Another name, same structure. Internally, the nasal cavity opens into the nasopharynx by the way of the conae. Cone is an opening that opens up to the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx is the most superior portion of the pharynx. There are three parts to the pharynx. This is the first. It's called the nasopharynx. This is where the adenoids live, right? This is where the eustachian tube lives. So you've got the nares there. The cone is in this area here, pretty much at the back end or the dorsal side of the turbinates. Here's the adenoids, and here's the eustachian tube. It's part of the auditory tube that's going to go to the inner ear. But this is all part of the pharynx back here. That's all pharynx. That's nasopharynx. It's not the whole thing. Only one third. For 
protruding immediately from each lateral wall of the nasal cavity or the conchae or the turbinates. There are three, the superior, the middle, and the inferior. So you can put in there turbinates. I like turbinates better only because it explains this type of airflow, so it's easy to remember the airflow. Conche is, all I think of is a snail. And that's where that actually comes from, so. Questions? So the nasal conche, again, we've gone through this, cause turbulent flow, and that's actually a good thing. You actually don't want turbulent flow in your cardiovascular system. Then it's bad, okay? And that's what blood clots do. They cause turbulent flow. So in your cardiovascular system, you actually want it to be super efficient. And the rest of your airway system, the lower airway part here, you want to have laminar flow. This is the only place in the, in the respiratory system where you actually want turbulent flow. <coughs> because of all the reasons that we mentioned. So these are just the, the turbinates. There's number one, there's superior, there's the middle, and then there's the inferior. Some of our models downstairs don't have all three. Some do. Okay, you can take a look here at the sinuses. So if you take someone and you cut their face off, basically, right? That's what we did, you cut their face off. Right, here's the tongue. And you can see the sinuses in here. We'll talk about them in a second. And this is what it looks like, but you can see there are three. This is the superior, this is the middle, and this is the inferior turbinate. And you can see there's a lot of blockage in there, and you can, you can totally understand from this picture how the air becomes turbulent, right? Because there's a lot of cracks and crevices going in, on in here. nasal cavity is lined and we're back to cells again, epithelial cells, you can't get away from them this semester. The nasal cavity is lined with stratified squamous epithelium and pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar. Why is the nasal cavity lined with stratified squamous epithelium? What is strati where else do you find stratified squamous epithelium? Yep. Skin. Yep. Okay, so what's the similarity between the skin and the inside of this nasal cavity? Why do they both have the same? Yep. Is that why? So it's a protection. Any other reason? Why does this area have stratified squamous epithelium. Eliza said it's for protection. She's not wrong, but I don't think it's what she says. What, it's, what is it protecting against? Is it the bacteria that it's protecting against? So she's half right. Jordan. Okay, it's from the ear. What, why is the ear dangerous? And you said abrasion. Yes, that's what it is. So you're, you're shearing. Think about a shearing wind, okay? Think about it in terms of you have a house that sits out, I don't know, somewhere near an open field. Right? You have a high, high, high speed wind, which called shearing force wind. It's not a hurricane, it's not a tornado, right? What will it do if, it, if the speed of that wind is fast enough to the side of your house, assuming it's got siding on it? It'll rip it off. That's exactly what's happening to the inside of your nasal passages when you breathe. You're causing damage all the time. If you sneeze, if you cough, and anything that comes through there at a high velocity, right, you can clock a sneeze at over 250 miles an hour. That's a lot of air. That's a lot of force. In a small area, what is that doing to those cells? It's damaging them. If you damage something very often, what epithelial cell type do you want there? 
stratified squamous epithelium. Why? Because it can do what better than any of the others? What can it do that's better than the other ones? Stratified squamous epithelium is better at what? Mitosis. It can regenerate itself faster. That's exactly why you want it there. Okay? Now, the question is, why do you want pseudostratified ciliated columnar mixed in there, too? It, because it doesn't generate as fast. Yep. The cilia. And what else is associated with these? If there's cilia, there's probably what? Mucus. Goblet cells. That's why you got to have them both. you got to have a combination. Okay? So this looks like... If you take a look at this, very similar to skin, there are differences, right? There's no stratum cornea here, right? Because if this was your skin, this top layer here, would you see these? No, it'd be dead. You couldn't see them, right? So that's how you know this isn't skin. But the, the idea is the same. And then again, we have these. This is we've seen this multiple times this semester, right? These are pseudostratified ciliated columnar. These are cilia, and they here's a goblet cell. Here's one here, here, and here. Same reason. You know one, you know all. Okay, the pharynx divided into three regions, and they are the nasopharynx, which we just looked at. Right? The nasopharynx, this is where the connection to your inner ear occurs. So if you go into medicine, some field of medicine, and you want to become an otolaryngologist, right, an ears, nose, and throats person, then this is where you do most of your um, healing, right? These are the ones that put the tubes in your ears. These are the ones that look at all these different novelties, these strange things that people are born with. Alright, so the nasopharynx we just looked at, we'll look at it again. The it is located posterior to the nasal cavity. It's where the adenoids are. When you swallow, the soft palate and the uvula close off this. Most of the time when you eat, you don't have food coming out your nose. Right? Am I wrong? Anybody here has food coming out their nose every time they eat? You should sign up for Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. Yeah, I'm sure you could be a sideshow. All right, so most of you don't have that happen, and it's because of the soft palate and the uvula. That's that thing that hangs in the back of your throat. It's not a console. Okay, that's the uvula. So this thing is the uvula, there is a tonsil attached to it, but they're separate, right? They're not the same structure. This is part of the soft palate. This is a soft palate. So when you eat, your tongue pushes a bolus of food back. This whole structure here goes up and plugs up this hole so that food can't come out. Yes, Eliza? Well, when you have water, it vibrates. Yeah, so when you, if somebody, and everybody's see, at least seen one of these. Right? If you haven't had it happen to you, you're sitting at a lunch table when you're a kid, usually this happens. Because kids, I mean, let's face it, small children laugh a lot more than us. They do. And they think everything's funny. Oops. They think everything is funny. Right? And so this is probably when you've seen this. Or at a frat party. Maybe one of those. Okay. But yeah, what ends up happening is you're chewing something, right? And then, so this is all moved in here. Oh, it's all good. You're, or you're swallowing milk, and all of a sudden somebody makes you laugh, and what happens is it'll come back down very quickly. It starts to vibrate in and out, up and down. And when that happens, and you're pushing food back, and you have enough force with air coming up out of this tube here, right? So this thing is moving up and down. The fluid's trying to move down. The air moves up, and then it shoots out your nose. That's what happens. It's a very violent thing that's occurring. <laughs> that seems really, really funny to everybody else but the person that has the stuff coming out of their mouth, right? It's, it's funny, I and mean, it's good fun if you're not the person that has it coming out of their nose. So anyway, that's what's happening. So this is the nasopharynx, right? Again, here's the adenoid, here's the eustachian tube, here's the 
the palatine tonsil, here's the uvula, your knees fold up. Okay, it contains the opening for the auditory tubes, that's also called the eustachian tube. Remember, the auditory tubes equalize pressure between the middle ear and the nasal pharynx. So here's where, when you go up to altitude, usually in a plane, right, there's less pressure. Going up isn't so bad, right? Going up is usually okay, you don't notice it much, the pressure comes off as you go up in altitude. Usually the problem is, for some small children for sure, you take a baby on a flight, it's, it's, you can do it, it's not going to kill them, but sometimes small children, they, they don't know what's going on and they cry because it hurts on the way down. Because on the way down, for some people, not everybody, the, the middle ear, because there's some constriction somewhere, because of the way your anatomy is, it, the ear doesn't equalize very, very good. So what do you have to do? Very well. So you have to swallow, chew gum, right? Because when you're doing that, it will move air in and out of this too much more quickly. Because what's happening, right, what's happening is you've got air coming through this side of the ear, and as you come down, what's it doing? It's, there's more pressure pushing on the inner ear, right? And so you're jamming, so the inner ear is starting it's usually flat like that, it's starting to fold in. And that's what hurts, the drum. The eardrum is being folded. And if there's not enough equalizing pressure on the other side, so if there's less pressure on the inside than there's coming from the outside, it hurts. And if you have an ear infection or a throat infection, you shouldn't fly. Yeah? So why does chewing gum help? Chewing gum makes the, moves enough air in and out that the pressure now begins to equalize. The problem is that the tube is really small and it's back up into the top of your throat here, right? And it, the more air you move, the chewing, the more of this happens, the more you can jam air into that hole in here, right? Because it's a small hole. And if you don't, then there's less pressure in there. And if you have problems with sinus infections, it's even more constricted. So what's the problem? You can't get the air in there to equalize, right? Because you basically have this scenario going. So you've got, this is the ear, right? Here's the eustachian tube down here. Here's the eardrum, right? So you, as you're coming down, what's happening to the pressure as you come down from 35,000 feet? going up. So there's more pressure here, right? So what starts to happen to this thing? It starts to bow in. You've got to equalize the pressure on this side. The problem is the tube's really small and it's located in the back of your throat, where in the nasal passage. So the chewing and the, and the, the swallowing forces air back here so that it goes back to this that's what's starting to happen, yeah? So once you're like off the plane, it takes a while to like equalize again for people who have to so that's why you have Yeah, to so when I fly, I, and so for me, because I was one of these kids that had lots of problems with their ears, I had tubes in my ears, I had to have my tonsils removed, I can't hear very well if I fly for about, I don't know, like 20 minutes when I get off the plane. Like my inner ear here is screwed up. It's scarred over, it's got all kinds of issues. And so, if you were one of these people, then you probably have more issues. The general population, as long as it's healthy, probably doesn't take as long. But again, the, the pressure is still equalizing. The ossicles, the three little bones, everything's put, there's pressure on everything. Depending on how much mucus is in here, right? If you've got a lot of cerumen that's gunking this up, that's problematic. If there's a lot of gunk in here, that's problematic. So, but yeah, for me personally, 20 minutes, a half hour, I can't hear anything. You could scream at me. And I'd be like, okay, uh-huh, yeah, it's great. I have no idea what you're saying. So, yeah, but that's what happens, okay? So if you've ever had that happen to you, now you know why. Posterior surface of the nasopharynx contains the pharyngeal tonsil. We were talking about it's the adenoids, right? So this is a 
again, the second or the third time you've said it. So that's up there. Okay, now we get to the second part. The nasopharynx is lined with pseudo stratified columnar epithelium. So the nasal cavity has stratified, stratified epithelium and pseudostratified ciliated columnar. The nasopharynx doesn't have the other one. Why? What's happened to the airflow by the time it gets to the nasopharynx because of the turbulent flow? Is it moving very quickly? Can you move a lot of air through your nose? No. But the damage is being done where? In here. That's where you need the pseudo stratified. By the time you get back here, right, somewhere in here, it's slow the air, right? So there's, a, there's really no need to have that pseudo stratified, but you still have a need to have what? Goblet cells in there to, to trap substances part of your immune system. So if you think about it practically, if you work your way through it, it, it makes sense. It should. Okay, the oral pharynx, this is part where your mouth is, right? This is the second third, located posterior to the oral cavity, behind the tongue, dorsal to the tongue, is continuous with the oral cavity by way of the fauces. The cone is the separation point between the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx. The fauces is the, the um, like I said, the Mason-Dixon line, right? The border between the mouth and this part of the pharynx. The palatine and the lingual tonsils, which we've already talked about, are located here, right? The palatine tonsil is the one hanging off the uvula, and the lingual tonsil sits at the very back end of the tongue. This is the one, because it's behind the tongue, that some people have a lot of irritation when they have their tonsils out. So here's the oral pharynx. This area right here between this tonsil and this thing called the epiglottis, this is the fauces right here. Remember the cone is right here. This is the fauces. This is the oral pharynx. That's the fauces. The oral pharynx is lined with stratified squamous epithelia. Why? Because every time you eat and every time you drink, you slough off all of those cells. And so this, as Annika said, is the, has the highest rate of mitosis. They're really good at replacing themselves. Which means what? What's the, what's the deal you make with the devil whenever you have this type of cell type? The good news is that they can reproduce. The bad news is what? That we're susceptible to mutations. Susceptible to mutations and cancer. That's right. So the laryngopharynx is the last of the three parts. It is located posterior behind the epiglottis and the larynx. This is the connection point between where your food goes and where your air goes. All right? And if you can feel it, you can actually feel below the, the Adam's apple, right? These are, you can actually feel the tracheal rings. That means the airway must be in front of the esophagus. The esophagus is behind it. It's continuous with the esophagus. It is also lined with stratified squamous epithelium. Again, it totally makes sense, right? You're, you're, you're abrading this area constantly. And the air that flows through your mouth is flowing at a higher rate, a higher velocity than flowing through your nose. So even just the air going in and out is going to cause more damage. But that's not the big problem. The big problem is the food and the water. Hot stuff. Think about some of the hot stuff that we eat. 
either hot in terms of the temperature or spicy, right? So this is the Lorenzo pharynx. This piece of cartilage here, right, is the epiglottis. This opening here is called the glottis. And when you learned about condyles and epicondyles, what is an epicondyle? It's a bump on top of another bump. So epi means on top of, right? So the epiglottis covers the glottis. The glottis is also known as the glottic aperture. I'll spell it for you. So you have the epiglottis, right, which is a flap of cartilage, right, that covers the glottis, covers the glottis, also known as the glottic aperture. An aperture is an opening. People confuse those two all the time. They get them wrong every year. Glottis, glottic aperture, epiglottis. Epi means on top of. That means it has to be this flap of cartilage. The larynx. Major structures. There's a lot going on here. Okay. So you have the thyroid cartilage. Guess what's surrounding the thyroid cartilage? Thyroid gland. Yes. You have the cricoid cartilage. You have the epiglottis, you have what are called the false vocal cords, and then the true vocal cords. The false, vo the false vocal cords have nothing to do with producing sound. They look like them, but they, they don't do anything. Okay, the thyroid cartilage is located superior to the thyroid gland above it. It is composed of hyaline cartilage. All of the cartilage that surrounds the trachea and this area is all hyaline cartilage. It's all very smooth and glassy-like. It's not fibro cartilage because it's not weight-bearing, and it's not elastic cartilage like on my ear. Functions in maintaining an open airway. It's really good, like your ribs, right? Part of your ribs the costochondral cartilage that connects the bone rib to the sternum is also made of hyaline cartilage. It's really good at keeping structures open. I'll show you a picture of all these. Often called the Adam's apple. The thyroid cartilage is your Adam's apple. It is larger in males, generally speaking, than females. Right? Part of the structure, part of the reason is because our voc of our vocal cords, right? Males' vocal cords, the reason males' voices are lower than females is because our cords are physically thicker. They can't vibrate at the same frequency. And the thicker your vocal cords, the lower your voice. The thinner your vocal cords, the higher you pitched your voice. So here's the here's the um, the laryngeal cartilage, the thyroid cartilage, right? This is something called the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone protects this part of the soft um, of the the palate, okay? Of the uh, pharynx, excuse me. So here's the thyroid cartilage. Here's the thyroid gland. This is the first tracheal ring. That's what the cricoid cartilage is. If you go right under the Adam's apple and you feel the very first ring, right about there, it's the biggest. It's the cricoid cartilage. So hyoid bone is way up here. I told you I used to put this one when I used to do the labs myself. I used to put this one on the, on the bone test. And ask what it was, and people would tell me it was a baby's jaw. <laughs> I was always entertained. 
<laughs> baby's jaw. It looks like a jaw, but it's not. It's wrong. It's funny, though. Baby's jaw. All right, this is a better diagram. We actually have a model like this in the lab, right? So you've got the thyroid cartilage, right? This is the, the original prominence. There's the hyoid bone. Here's a thy thyro, thyro hyoid membrane that connects the two. This is that cricothyroid. Um, this is the membrane. This is the cricoid cartilage. And then these are the rest of the tracheal rings. So there's lots of membrane in there. Okay, so when people have an airway collapse during the, during the night, if you have sleep apnea, right? If you have obstructive sleep apnea, is, is the problem here? No. The problem's where? The problem's up here in the pharyngeal area. Okay? If you have an allergic reaction, a severe anaphylaxis, is the problem in here? No. It's here. So it, it can happen, it can happen where somebody's airway collapses, so hopefully when it happens, um, that the upper airway, this is also known as the lower airway, that the upper airway or the pharynx collapses, so then you have to have um, a tracheotomy, and what they usually do is they'll go in here, and then they will cut a hole if they can. Okay, with a with a blade. So you, if you've ever seen somebody with a tooth that's in their trachea because they've had some damage up here, or if you've seen a quadriplegic who's had that, that's where they're they're doing the surgery to make a hole between these down here because they've got a. The, where's the problem? So they've got to bypass the problem and the problem. So you go down here. Yeah, out. What's that? How do they talk? They gotta put their thumb over. Because the air's coming out. Does that make sense? Is that like yeah. like those smoker commercial things where they have to like pull? Yeah, because if they don't put the if they don't put the thumb over the, the tracheostomy, the tracheostomy tube, we, we do this on goats all the time, so I I, I don't have a tube with me. A couple of years ago when I was going back and forth in the medical college a lot, I actually brought in um, tracheal tubes and tracheostomy tubes. But yeah, you gotta put your thumb over it because or else air's coming out there. Yeah. That's dry air going in, so are they moisture? They have filters and then they have to get hooked up to um, they have to get hooked up to a machine twice a day that moistens it. We have to do the same thing that the goats we have on the trachea. Twice a day they gotta get hooked up to this machine and you trickle in water into it. And then you gotta put antibiotics into it. This gross, because you gotta pull that tracheal tube out twice a day. Go to foul animals. And it's disgusting. Like the stuff that comes out of there is just not fit for man or beast. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah. But if your, if your dissertation depends on it, though, you just love it. Fantastic. And you're there at like one or two in the morning, too. But they have a filter system on it, so that helps a little bit. Yeah. Because we were studying sleep apnea. We were studying sleep apnea, and so we were injecting drugs into their brain that might make their airway collapse. And so we didn't want them to die. So we had to tracheostomize them. Dr. Miller, he may, you gotta ask Dr. Justin Miller, he may have done, I, I was part of these studies, they weren't part of my dissertation, but Miller may have done some tracheostomies. No, no graduate student ever wants them. Because you're there seven days a week. You're like a physician for a dog. Like you're there all the time. You have no life. Zero. Zero life. What's that? Why don't you just come on that? Yeah, you, I could. I'm, I can do surgery on goats. I mean, we're both goat surgeons. And we've done all kinds of surgery on that. It would take a, a lot of explanation over a lot of beers at many bars to explain the woes. So anyway. Yeah, anyway, so but so they're um, so this is where they put a tracheostomy hole in and a tube. Again, the reason you put it down here is because the problem is north. Does that make sense, everybody? 
So, if you've ever seen it, um, there used to be a show on in the early 90s called ER, and there was an episode in ER where Julianne Margulies, the good wife, was she was a nurse. She was dating George Clooney on the show. And um, she, she went into a, a convenience store in Chicago, because that's where ER took place, and somebody's airway collapsed. And so what she had to do is she used a, like a butter knife because this guy's airway had collapsed, and she cut through the trachea here, and then she inserted, she took a pen apart, and she inserted the inside of a pen, you know, the old ballpoint pens that you could take apart, and she shoved it in there to keep them alive. That, that you could do that. The problem with the doing it that way is that there's massive infection, but better to be infected and alive than not infected and dead. Kind of. Yeah, it's probably it's a no-brainer, right? It's a no-brainer. All right, so this you should know. This you should put on your list of, I need to know this. Well, need I say this another way? It's important, this diagram right here. Very, very important. Okay? Okay, the cricoid cartilage, we spoke through this again, I just said it, right? It's located inferior to thyroid cartilage, it's the composed of hyaline cartilage, it's the first tracheal ring. And all of these rings prevent the airway, the trachea, from collapsing. Okay, so unless somebody kicks you there, or you get into a car accident, it's not likely that the trachea is going to collapse. Same thing as cricoid cartilage. Cricoid. All right, the epiglottis is composed of elastic cartilage, right? It sits over, epi means above, on top of. Functions in closing off the opening to the larynx. So the epiglottis is what prevents food from going down into your airway when you swallow the food. again, can become somewhat problematic. You eat something that's too big, it gets jammed between the two. You start laughing or talking when you're eating, it gets jammed in between the two. That's when it becomes problematic and you have to perform the Heimlich on somebody. This is the epiglottis, this is the glottis. So this is the trachea, this is the esophagus. So here's the food, it magically goes down, the, glot, the epiglottis would have come down, I, I don't have that part of it animated, and it would have prevented anything from going down this tube. Okay, so you have the false vocal cords, which are in that area, which are also lined with stratified squamous, again, all of these areas are moving lots of air quickly, they're moving food, right, so they all have stratified squamous. The remainder of the larynx is lined with pseudo-stratified columnar. Again, by the time it gets here, it's starting to slow down, and you're more concerned about bacterial infection. And so you've got to have a lot of cells that can produce mucus and have cilia. I think I have a diagram of that person's face, that side view, with all of the different types where you find each of the types of uh, epithelial cells. Trachea is the windpipe, right? Tubular passage of air located anterior to the esophagus. Consists of C-shaped rings. Those tracheal rings in the front, where you can feel it, that's where they're solid. But in the back, where you can't, don't try it, Right? They actually have an opening. They look like a C. And there's a muscle in between. So that the trachea has a small ability, very small ability, 
to, to constrict and dilate, but not very much because of that C. So they're not solid all the way around. That muscle is called the tracheality. Yes, Annika. What's the point of like, allowing the trachea? Sometimes, what good? What's the point of allowing the trachea to move at all? What might be a reason? Why might it have it need small amount of ability to dilate or constrict? Yep, exactly. Well, maybe if there's a large amount of fluid passing through the cell, it just won't uh, press on the trachea. Not a food issue, yep. It's not a food issue at all. It's an air issue. Yep, CJ. What's that? Oh. Yeah. When you need to move more or less air. So it closes down a little bit because it will protect you more. It Because something you'll learn next semester when you're thinking about the mechanics of breathing, you're also going to talk about the mechanics of fluid flow. So you're basically you're talking about airway mechanics, air mechanics, and fluid mechanics, baby physics I call it. Is that when the tube gets smaller, is it harder or easier to move something through it? It's harder. And when the tube gets bigger, it's easier. So during times of maximal exertion, that, so that the tube is in the middle. Most of the systems in your body and everything is set in the middle of the range. You can think about it like driving down a highway, a three-lane highway, and being in the middle, right? You have options of going left or right. And so you're usually set in the middle. If you need more airflow, you need a bigger diameter tube. Well, how are you going to get a bigger diameter tube? It's got to dilate. But if in times when it gets really, really cold, do you want more air going down into the lungs or do you want less? This is even if you're breathing through your nose. Well, the answer is you want less, so you want the thing to get smaller. So in the winter months, it'll constrict the tracheal's muscle. But when it's really hot, okay, and everybody's had this where it's hot and you're exercising, you want maximal airflow. The bigger the tube, the more air you move. That. Would this muscle also be the target of adrenaline? Yeah. So adrenaline, epinephrine whether it's natural or not, would definitely open this up a little bit. It'll open up all of the other airways too. Yep. So, yeah, it would dilate this muscle, not constrict it. So here's the larynx, here's the cricoid cartilage, here's the trachea, the C-rings, and it goes all the way into the bronchi, and you should know the different lobes. Here's the primary bronchi, and then you've got secondary, you should know this should know this. Mark it on your paper. Thank you. Good. All right. You should know all the segments here. You've got the low bar, the segmental, the bronchioles, and then the final, the small bronchioles, and eventually you have the alveoli. And the carina is the point where the two split. This is the last slide for today. I'll, I'll let you go after this. Okay. Here's the esophagus, here's the trachea. You can see the C-rings. This is an above view, right? So you're superior to this. You can see the cartilage here, and this is the trachealis muscle, okay? And here's the esophagus. So they can get a little smaller and a little bit bigger. Okay, somebody turn on the lights. Three most important things. Respiratory system, yep. Functions. Basic functions always start, as with any of these topics, with the most basic. If you don't know the basic, you do not have the right to move on to anything more complicated. Start there. Good. Next. Yep. Three types of the pharynx, the three parts, right? There's the naso, the oro, and the laryngeo. They're all lined slightly differently, and they do slight different things. Yep. One more. Yep, Katie. Um, the major parts of the yep, you know all those parts. All right, so we've got one more lecture of material for the third exam. We'll do that on Monday. We'll probably do a Martino moment on Monday too. So have a fantastic weekend. Okay, be safe.